This next video will focus on women as virtuous. We'll look at more examples of women who are connected to holy or spiritual aspects. We'll also look at examples of women in art represented as virtuous. We'll look at some early examples of women artists and also women uh, who were authors, so involved in the production of literature, and also examples of celebrating women through their biographies. And we'll continue to also look at images of the Virgin Mary. Most of the images in this lecture are from Europe, uh, medieval and Renaissance Europe, but there is one example from colonial Mexico at the end. So starting off, looking at women as virtuous, wife, saint, nun, and mother. In the last lecture, we were looking at a work by Jan van Eyck, The Virgin in the Church, with this ideal of the Virgin Mary as, as this wonderful mother, this mother that all could look up to, this kind of mother to all in the Christian context. We see her here really filling up the space of the church, that idea that her body was connected to the church itself. Remember, she's within this Gothic style church, so um, it's very much a church of the style of the time um, and a few centuries earlier as well. We see her glorified by jewels, by gemstones, so she's wearing a crown, marking her as a queen, um, the queen of heaven, and then also the gemstones around her collar. Uh, she's properly covered up. She's wearing her blue and red, uh, which is very typical of the Virgin. But she's also shown as having this very intimate relationship with her son. And so you see her holding the Christ child who grasps at her uh, collar, who grasps at her their neckline, which is this very sweet mother and child moment. So just to kind of reorient us to some of the material from the medieval and Renaissance period. Um, and remember, Jan van Eck is from Flanders, so Ren early Renaissance Flanders. Moving on, thinking about a work that's slightly earlier called the Bayou Tapestry. It's actually an embroidery, um, so it's needlework. And this is actually an example that was probably created by women. So needlework was really important for women. It was a sign of virtue if a woman did a lot of weaving or needlework or sewing because it kept her busy, um, but maybe not thinking too much. Uh, but this is a great example of a work. It's, it's over 200 feet long. It's this very long scroll recounting the history of the Battle of Hastings. So this really interesting moment where women are contributing to the creation of important works of art. So again, we're not 100% sure, but it's likely that women participated in embroidering this particular tapestry that's so important in art history, especially because so few uh, textiles do survive. So it records this battle, the Battle of Hastings from 1066, so it was created, created shortly after that. Um, and so this was a battle between a, a man named Harold and William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror will be the one who is the winner. The uh, tapestry or embroidery itself does not have a lot of women represented. I think there are three total in the main narrative. And so here's one example that's somewhat of a mystery to us because we don't know what the exact story is based around, um, but it does, in, there's the inscription that says, here a certain cleric, Anne Elfgaiva. So we see a woman who's in this kind of enclosed space with a cleric, you can see him by his tonsure, that kind of bald mark on his head, um, who's reaching in in some kind of gesture, probably of harassment, maybe some kind of assault that happened that the 11th century audience would have been familiar with. But unfortunately that story is now lost to us. But the idea that we are seeing a woman who looks very much covered, who looks like she's a woman who was very virtuous, who was doing what she was supposed to do as a woman, and yet still you have this man who seems to be invading her space. And then we also have this kind of what's called a preapic figure, or a figure with a large phallus, who's maybe alluding to the type of inappropriate behavior that people would have known occurred between these individuals or that this cleric carried out. And then also other kind of menacing imagery. Uh, here's a close-up so you, that you can see the two of them, and you can see that tonsure mark a little bit more clearly, and you see him reaching into that space. And then also, here's another instance of a woman in the Bayou Tapestry. So there's a moment in the battle where the, the soldiers come in and start burning down houses, and so you can see a mother and her son escaping one of these homes. They look rather calm, but of course this would have been a rather frightening event. Um, but you can clearly see that in these tales of battle, women were not heavily featured, they were not uh, the main parts of the storyline. This was based around Harold and William the Conqueror, and so that was the main focus of the tapestry. But in these over 200 feet, there are very, very, very few women. Um, there's also written inscriptions, as we noted in the previous story, that help to 
tell us who's represented. For example, you can see the name Harold written here and William written here. Moving on and thinking about Hildegard of Bingen, who was a very important figure. Um, she was an abbess, so the leader of an abbey of nuns, and very well educated. She was the producer of music, scientific treatises. She also received visions. So she began receiving her visions when she was very young. And later historians have often thought, oh, well, maybe she just had severe migraines, or they've kind of dismissed these visions. But they are rendered in really beautiful um, and almost abstract styles in some instances, which we'll see in just a minute. So she did have artists carry out uh, representations of these visions, these divine visions that she had. She dictated her visions to a monk, which we seem to see here in this uh, portion of an illustrated manuscript. So we see Hildegard sitting almost in a trance um, with these almost tentacles or like flames uh, reaching towards her. Uh, the buildings are highly abstracted behind her, and then you see this monk slightly in her space, but not in that kind of menacing way that we saw previously on the Bayou Tapestry, who seems to be recording the kinds of things that she might be reciting. And she too is probably writing them down on a wax tablet. We see here um, the whole page that this image comes from. So you can see that it is part of a book. It is part of a codex. And so the most luxurious manuscripts will Almost all manuscripts were very luxurious at this time because they were all hand done, um, but adding these really elaborate initials, adding these images was really a sign of a very, very luxurious and expensive manuscript. And so Hildegard did have these important visions, and so um, she probably oversaw artists who recreated them and who were, you know, could put them in a manuscript and thus share them. Unfortunately, this manuscript was lost during World War II, and so we only have facsimiles. So this is known as Scivias, Know the Ways of the Lord, and it describes 26 of Hildegard's most vivid visions. This one is known as the universe, an almighty and incomprehensible God surrounded by fire. And so we have this kind of rendering of the universe, um, the idea perhaps of the sun and the moon, the starry skies, uh, and you can see the fiery elements that is that are referred to. But again, very abstract and gives you a sense of what she actually must have pictured when she was having these, these particular visions. And the colors are especially rich. Here's another image. So most of these related to the divine, or these did relate to the divine and also to salvation. So we're seeing Hildegard of Bingen. Um, so this is from Germ Bingen is Germany. Um, this is again Scivias, but this is image seven. The previous one was image three, I believe. Um, yeah, third vision. And here we're seeing the extraction of the soul. So you can see this kind of uh, idea of when someone dies, the soul is extracted, and this debate between heaven and hell. Where is the soul going to go? And this was very much on the minds of those in uh, Romanesque Europe. And here's just one more example. Here we're seeing her vision of the Trinity, the idea of God in three parts, and the idea of the church and the Holy Spirit represented as well. So very creative renderings and, and does, they all give us a sense of her vision. Uh, we don't know if women artists actually created these, so it may have been male artists, but again, Hildegard would have overseen it. Hildegard also believed that women weren't necessarily equal to men, um, but she did believe that women could have important contributions. Thinking of the importance of women in history, uh, we're looking at an illustration from De Claris Mulieribus, which is, uh, it means concerning famous women or on famous women, which was a uh, basically a lot of biographies that were written by Giovanni Boccaccio, who's one of the most important Italian authors of the 14th century. So this is the first collection devoted exclusively to the biography, the biographies of women in Western literature. Even though Giovanni Boccaccio readily admitted that he didn't think women were very talented, that talent among women was quite scarce. So he seemed to be kind of following in the traditions of the time to say, you know, women aren't that talented, but there's a few of them, so I'll talk about those. Um, in one example, he talks about St. Marcia, who was known as an early female artist. We really don't know very much about her, but uh, it said that she died in 682. 
Uh, but I think this rendering is interesting because you're seeing a woman artist creating a self-portrait, which is really common among early women artists, because they didn't have a lot of options in terms of what to represent. They could represent themselves, they could represent interior scenes, um, but they really couldn't get out of the house and they didn't have a lot of access to models. So a self-portrait was really common. And also people thought it was so extraordinary when a woman created a portrait um, that a woman could paint. So there was almost this magical quality in that sense. So um, just a very early instance of showing a woman painting herself um, based on one of these historical women that, that Boccaccio decided to glorify in his text, Declaris Molieribus. An important female author who probably based uh, a lot of her work in studying important contributions of women, she probably based a lot of it on Boccaccio, um, but her name is Christine de Pizan. She's French, although she was born in modern day Italy, um, but she had a lot of connections to the French court and she rejected the idea of women often being um, basically pigeonholed as seducers, as troublemakers. So she also tried to glorify women through histories. And so we see her here writing away. She actually started writing um, poetry and later prose in order to support her family because her her excuse me her husband passed away, and so she really did need to uh, find a profession that would provide some kind of um, living for the family. So she wrote a book in prose called The Book of the City of Ladies, which again was to reject some of these ideas about women that had been put forth. So it celebrated historical women from Greece, from, from ancient Greece, from ancient Rome, uh, from Christian culture as well. And here's just an image representing the ideals of the Book of the City of Ladies, this idea that um, these women are piecing together a city, that each one is kind of a building block to creating this ideal city, um, this idea that you know men aren't always necessary. Uh, and so in here you can just see from that image one of the book covers. So a very important author. Um, here we're just seeing an artistic rendering of Christine de Pizan. She wasn't an artist herself, but she was a really important early thinker, writer who did glorify women in her, in her writing and really uh, did a lot to support them. Looking at an example of a portrait of a virtuous wife, this is actually a posthumous portrait. So a portrait meaning a posthumous portrait meaning this woman has already passed away. Um, so she was married into the Tornaboni family. Her name was Giovanni Tornaboni, um, but originally she was part of the Albizzi family. That's that's her maiden name. It was created in 1488 and there is a date on it, so we do know that this is the precise date. The portrait features a lot of evidence of wealth, so we know that she married into a very wealthy family. She also came from a wealthy family, um, but she has jewelry and very nice clothes, but none of it is overdone. She's not wearing too much jewelry. She's kind of wearing just enough that you know that her family is very wealthy. We're also reminded that her that she's very devout. We have possibly a book of prayers here, prayer beads or a rosary represented. She's in profile, so she's not looking at it us out at us directly. Uh, so doing exactly what a virtuous wife should do. It was very common for women to die quite young, especially in childbirth around this time. Let's look at some of the close-ups. So you can see that evidence of wealth through her jewelry. Uh, pearls were incredibly expensive around this time. And then of course, gold and gemstones would also be very pricey. Some details on her clothing, which includes some symbols that are included in the garment, um, including references to the initials of her husband. Here is that book of prayers where you can see the outline of the gold on the individual pages, the prayer beads in the background. You can see where the artist, who is Girlandayo, um, did the little highlights on these coral beads. And coral was often seen as protective and especially connected to um, Christian practice, um, the blood of the crucifixion it was sometimes linked to. You can also see her blonde hair, which was the preferred hair color at this time uh, on the Italian peninsula. There's also an inscription uh, that's, that's sourced from the poetry of Marshall, an ancient Roman poet, which is written in Latin, but translated means roughly art. Could you depict manners and soul more, more beautiful on earth? No painting would be. And then that date, 1488. So the idea that um, her manners and her soul, Giovanna Tornaboni's manners and soul really are extraordinary. And he's tried to make the most beautiful painting that he can. Um, but he's 
basically admitting that he you know can't get it to maybe the level that he wants it to but it was very common for artists to try to glorify their sitters in this kind of way our last artwork to look at is a way of escaping uh, Europe for a minute and to think about imagery that was created in colonial Mexico. This is a work by Miguel Gonzalez that's now in the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. It's done with mother of pearl inlay and also oil on, on canvas uh, that's been placed on wood. So this mother of pearl gives it this wonderful luminous quality um, and really gives the image a divine light, a true divine light when it's uh, properly illuminated. And so if you probably recognize the image, which would be the Virgin of Guadalupe. So there's this very holy image, very sacred image uh, that dates back to the 16th century that uh, is one of this these miraculous images that, you know, a, was created in Mexico around this time. And so there's a story of Juan Diego and how he was able to get his tilma to have this miraculous image of the Virgin Mary on it. And so he has multiple visions of the Virgin. So you see these multiple visions around the corners and then eventually where the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe appears on his tilma. So multiple times when he goes up to this hill um, outside of Mexico, outside of modern day Mexico City, the Virgin appears to him and asks him to build a church to her. And uh, he keeps going back to the archbishop and, and requesting this and keeps getting rejected. And finally, he needs to have some kind of sign. And so the Virgin tells him to collect roses, collect flowers into his tilma, which it's December. And so it's miraculous that there's flowers at all. And then he opens up the tilma and everyone sees this miraculous image, which is the Virgin of Guadalupe. And then, of course, it's repeated many, many times over in artwork, such as the example artwork that we're seeing here with the mother of pearl inlay. Um, so here's one of those visions where you can see the Virgin appearing again and again in those different corners, and then finally that appearance on the tilma of the Virgin herself. So a very sacred image, again, reproduced many times, so some people would want it for their own private collection, but there's only one you know, original, which is on display in um, a very important church, again, uh, just outside of Mexico City, and is an important pilgrimage site every December for those who come to see the Virgin of Guadalupe and to worship her. All right, so the next video will be more about scandalous women, so we'll move on to that next.